Pirates. I'm going for the Pirates. All aboard the Maersk Alabama with the real Captain Phillips. One of the lessons I learned is never trust a pirate. Plus, do you know what your child is taking to make the grade? People do offer it to each other. It's not a big deal. Adderall abuse on today's 700 Club. Welcome to this edition of the 700 Club. You know, when you're dealing with computers, they talk in terms of man years. It will take 30 man years to fix the problem. Well, the problem with Obamacare, they're looking between 3 million and 5 million lines of code that need to be rewritten. I have no idea what all that means, except they're using terms like failure, disaster, catastrophe on this uh, signature uh, uh, initiative of the federal government. Terry, have you signed up yet? I know I haven't. <laughs> no, I haven't. They say it's not going to be fixed for any time soon, and Internet experts are saying that the website was pushed out way too fast, despite warnings ahead of time that it wasn't ready. Dale Hurd has the story. There's no sugarcoating it. President Obama almost acted surprised Monday when he admitted that the rollout of Obamacare and the website healthcare.gov has been a disaster. But the complaints about the shockingly dysfunctional government website began as soon as it was turned on. 19 million people have logged on to the website only to find confusing error messages, broken calculators, wrong information on Medicaid eligibility, or just long delays and timeouts. Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius is expected to testify before Congress next week. Her department spent $500 million to build this site, and critics call it a complete failure. A visit to the website is kind of like a trip to the Department of Motor Vehicles in your state. Except that most DMV sites work. If they can't even handle the enrollment, how can they handle the actual system? It is truly truly shocking even to us how badly things are going. The president has promised to fix the problems, even reportedly reaching out to telecommunications giant Verizon for help. Meanwhile, Consumer Reports has warned its members to stay away from the website. The online system needs so many repairs that experts warn it might not operate smoothly until after the December 15 deadline for people to sign up for coverage starting in January. One specialist said that as many as 5 million lines of software code may need to be rewritten before the website runs properly. But there are bigger problems. Obamacare itself may just be too expensive for most Americans. We could actually see an increase uh, initially in the number of uninsured, believe it or not, out of all of this. If the rollout is as disastrous as it's shaping up to be over the next couple months, uh, and people are pushed out of uh, current coverage and find the alternatives too expensive, it could actually make the problems worse. And, so and critics like Senator Tom Coburn say that in the end, Obamacare is doomed because it just can't work. Obamacare is going to fail on its own right. And uh, you just talked about the number of people that have signed up. The fact is, is the sick people are signing up, the healthy aren't. A and they're not going to because the deductibles are so high and the cost is going to be high. Dale Hurd, CBN News. We're going to try to do a story for you tomorrow. As I understand it, this um, particular initiative, the software initiative, was farmed out to a Canadian company which had failed and was dismissed by Canada because of the problems they had, and yet they were chosen uh, <clears throat> out of many people who were bidding to do this job. And we're talking about spending hundreds of millions of dollars on this thing, and it has been a colossal failure. Well, and that's just the failure of the system that's that's handling the signing on and all of that. But Pat, the system itself, once you're in it, is so flawed. Why didn't anybody look at the costs involved? You talked about young people the other day. Mm. Kids coming out of college, they're already in debt with college yeah. loans. They cannot afford it, but they need the young people to sign up. So well, how does that work? This is a disaster of planned economy. Obama wanted to move America toward a Europe European-style socialism, and socialism says government will run everything. 
in your society. And the biggest chunk of our existence in America is health care. It's huge. It may occupy 20 percent or so of our total GDP. So the, uh, Obama wanted his hands on this as a good European socialist. That's what he wants. And so it's ideological, the fact that the thing is a screw up, it won't work, it goes against human reason. He doesn't care about all that. He's going to make it go regardless. It's, he's like a doctrinaire person defending the faith. And this is the faith. <clears throat> so keep in mind, you're not dealing with reason on this. You're dealing with a, uh, an ideology which is <clears throat> now proven to be flawed. And uh, as we've said, Obamacare is facing other challenges as well. In court, John Jessup has that story from Washington. Here's John. That's right, Pat. A battle against Obamacare's contraception mandate could be fought in the Supreme Court. The mandate requires businesses to provide insurance coverage for the morning after abortion pills and more. Hobby Lobby is asking the high court to hear its case. The Christian family who owns the craft store chain says the policy forces them to violate their religious beliefs or pay millions in fines. A district court temporarily exempted their business from the mandate in July. The Department of Health and Human Services then filed a notice in federal court to appeal that decision. The United States is condemning an attack by Islamic radicals on a Coptic church in Egypt this weekend that left four Christians dead. That statement comes after thousands gathered for the funeral of the four, including two sisters only 8 and 12 years old. Gary Lane has that story. It was a scene that's become all too familiar to Egyptian Christians. Another funeral. This time just one day after the victims had attended a joyous occasion, a wedding. An Islamist gunman riding on a motorcycle fired 15 shots at members of a wedding party as they left this Cairo church. Everyone knows that every Sunday there is a wedding in the church. There was a lot of traffic outside the church when a motorbike and a car approached the crowd outside the church. The car stopped and the gunman on the motorcycle started shooting and ran away. The attack killed four people, including eight-year-old Nermeen, who was excited about wearing her new dress and boots to the wedding. What is happening is targeting all of Egypt and not only the Christians. This is enough. People are getting sick and tired of this. On Saturday, northwest of Cairo in Islamia, members of a jihadist group that calls itself supporters of the Mahdi claimed responsibility for a car bombing outside a military intelligence building. The group warned Egyptians to avoid military and police buildings, saying they are legitimate targets for the Mujahideen. The Islamia bombing and other similar attacks in the Sinai suggest Egypt may be facing the start of an insurgency. The supporters of the Mahdi accuse Egyptian intelligence services and the military of waging war on Egyptians, which, quote, only benefits the enemies of the nation, Jews and Christians. Militant Islamists blame Christians and the military for the uprising last July that ended Mohamed Morsi's presidency and led to a crackdown against the Muslim Brotherhood. And it doesn't look like attacks against Christians, the military and police will end anytime soon. This was the scene at Cairo's Al-Azhar University Sunday, rioting pro-Morsi students opposing police. It was another weekend of political unrest, suggesting Egyptians are likely to face more violence and instability in the days ahead. Gary Lane, CBN News. Pat, the situation there just seems to be deteriorating. Well, it really won't if the military is allowed to have a free hand, but they're going to have to. The Muslim Brotherhood, let's face it, is a terrorist organization. Uh, it is a pro-Islamic terrorist organization. And ladies and gentlemen, how many people have got to be killed? How many uh, affronts to human decency have to take place before we recognize that Islam is not a religion of peace? Islam is a religion of hatred and violence. And you say, well, these people are just, they're just these radicals. They don't represent the majority. Yes, they do. This is pure, pure teaching from the Quran. Pure teaching from the Quran. We're in the process of doing a booklet that will show precisely what uh, Muhammad said, what uh, the interpretation of all this is and uh, what the followers of Islam want to, in their extreme form, want to uh, accomplish. 
killing, violence, but a little child, all excited because she's wearing her first dress to a wedding, to think of the hopes and dreams blotted out because some crazed uh, f fundamentalist radical shoots her down. But the United States, you see, has withdrawn its support of the people who would bring peace and stability. There needs to be a firm hand in Egypt. This whole thing, they've got to get it under control. There's just no way you can allow people just to go at will shooting and making mayhem among the population. And so we as a nation, the United States, need to support the military, which is in favor of pro-democracy Western principles. But oh no, the Obama administration says, well, we're not going to support you because uh, the Morsi administration uh, has been overthrown. Yes, we're not in favor of Muslim Brotherhood. John? Pat, back here at home, veterans from across the country are able to visit the nation's war memorials here in Washington again now that they've been reopened after the government shutdown. And for many of them this past weekend, it was an emotional experience. A far cry from scenes just a week ago, these military veterans roamed freely around Washington's war memorials, dedicated to honor their sacrifice and the freedoms they fought to defend. But for 16 days during the government shutdown, metal barricades blocked public access to them, prompting a lawsuit threat from the American Center for Law and Justice and rallies and protests from critics who accused the administration of heavy-handed tactics to hurt America's veterans. Well, the politics of pain that are being used by the president uh, go well over the line. These vets say they never would have imagined being forced to break through barricades after having fought for their country and breaking through enemy lines. It never should have been closed. For many of these American heroes, this was a trip of a lifetime made possible by the Honor Flight Network. The group flies aging vets from World War II and the Korean and Vietnam Wars to Washington free of charge. While they know the political issues that led to the shutdown are far from over, for right now, they're glad to see no one is being denied visiting these hallowed sites. Really great to be open again. Hurricane Raymond is hovering off Mexico's southern Pacific coast. Authorities have evacuated hundreds of people from low-lying coastal communities and are asking people to stay off roads and highways. The Category 3 storm is not expected to come fully ashore. Operation Blessing is on the ground in Mexico. Teams are deployed to the area expected to be the hit the hardest. Severe flooding has forced them to move to higher ground, but they're standing by to help victims with 14 mobile kitchens, three water purification units, and dozens of cleanup supplies. People who don't get enough sleep or don't sleep well have higher levels of a plaque in their brain that's linked to Alzheimer's. That's the finding from the study at John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Previous research has found a lack of sleep can be bad for your thinking abilities, but so far, researchers can't say for sure that bad sleep leads to Alzheimer's or that better sleep may help prevent it, although it may be possible. But it's always best to get a good night's rest. And Pat, if the study is true, it shows or bolsters other studies that show the restorative power of sleep. I'm all for sleep. I think it's great. I think a nap during the middle of the day. My father was a very active man, and he lived a long, long, uh, productive life. But he always had a nap. You know, my grandmother did too. She called it her 40 winks. 40 <laughs> winks, yeah. Well, I mean, they had wisdom. Yes, I think so too. You know, it kind of puts the day in perspective. In the hot countries, they have the siesta. Mm -hmm. Of course, that siesta gets a little silly. They go on for hours. And then in Spain, they sit up, you know, partying and drinking until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. But uh, I, I think a half an hour nap or something. Or I did too. It's refreshing. It's, mm -hmm. Very much. Yeah. Okay. So if my door to the office is closed, you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> well, coming up, the prescription drug that's supposed to give users an extra edge. Instead, it's sending them over the edge. Worst possible thing you could even imagine. Smart, good-looking kid, and the Adderall just destroyed them. Hear what's being done to stop Adderall abuse. That's next. Cell phones are great, but the amount some companies charge is just crazy. Since Connie and I switched to Consumer Cellular, we both get everything we want and we're paying about half what we used to. Do I have to buy the whole basket? No. Hey, you old cheapskate. Hey, Jack. Why pay for more than you need, right? That's why I keep telling you. 
Consumer cellular plans start at just $10 a month. And I'm finally ready. My contract's up. Oh, here's to the end of contracts. Yeah. Well, did you tell him how easy it is to switch? Well, of course I told him. It's really easy to switch. Okay. Consumer Cellular, simple plans with award-winning service and no contract. Start your 30-day risk-free trial today. Activation is free, a $35 value, and we'll ship it free. Or visit a Sears store today. And Consumer Cellular was selected as the exclusive wireless provider for AARP members. Ask about your special discounts. Call 1-800-460-7238. Go online to ConsumerCellular.com or visit a Sears store today. Wednesday. Are you walking your way into a life of pain just to look good? Hear how you can step into a better future. Women look far more beautiful when they walk comfortably in a shoe than when they're uh, tottering because it's uncomfortable. Plus, a runaway son. It was the worst moment of my life. How this dad found himself during the search for his kid. Wednesday on The 700 Club. Well, those of us from the, quote, greatest generation have a hard time keeping track of all the medications that are given to young people today. We've just heard of the dangers of Ritalin, and it's just being overprescribed in a shocking way. But there's a new one you may have or not heard called Adderall. It's one of the prescription drugs used to treat what they call attention deficit disorder. And 14 million young people in America between the ages of 20 and 40 take it. And many people think it's harmless. But that isn't always the case. Our Laurie Johnson tells us about one young man who was addicted to Adderall, and it cost him his life. Since childhood, Richard Fee lived a storybook life. Straight A's, star athlete, lots of friends. Then he started taking the prescription drug Adderall. It just changed his whole uh, thought process. Over the course of three years, Richard's life spiraled out of control until his father found him hanging in his closet. Uh, worst possible thing you could even imagine. I mean, here was this great kid that had everything going for him. Everything. Smart, good-looking kid, and... The Adderall just destroyed them. Adderall is prescribed for people with Attention Deficit Disorder, or ADD. Adderall works on the brain to help them focus better. But some people who do not have ADD believe Adderall makes them focus better, too. So they take it to help them study. Richard had mentioned to me that he had gotten an Adderall from one of his friends at exam time. He's not alone. An estimated one in five college students use it, largely unaware of the physical danger and that it's a felony to use someone else's prescription. You hear in the library during exam week, people asking each other, or, or you know, I, re I really need an Adderall pill. You know, people do offer it to each other. It's, it's not a big deal to people on campus. Soon, Richard wanted his own supply. If you go to a doctor and you just tell them you have the signs of ADD, that without any check, and they'll just give you a prescription. And that's basically what he did. Dr. Gretchen Lefevre Watson, a clinical psychologist, researches the misuse of drugs like Adderall. She says it's easy to fake ADD. If you talk to most college students, they could probably tell you um, a doctor or two or three in town to go to and what to say and do in order to get a prescription. Adderall is a class two narcotic, an amphetamine similar to cocaine. It can be very addictive. You can get a euphoric feeling um, with a crash afterwards. After college, Richard moved back home with his parents and convinced two separate doctors to each prescribe him Adderall. Yeah, Richard would be up for days, be up for three days in a row walk in the house 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning, wide awake. And then he would crash for a couple days and sleep for a couple days. The fees tried to get Richard's doctors to stop prescribing the drug. 
I said, you keep giving Adderall to my son, you're going to kill him. But Richard was over 18, and his doctors said legally Richard's treatment was private. He was actually stayed in the reception area behind the little class partition and said he couldn't talk to us. Richard's doctors both increased his dose. You can um, become more seriously addicted and become psychotic and lose the ability to um, think clearly and do things that you otherwise wouldn't do. I had seen him, he was on the, com the, the computer and he had just put little pieces of uh, scotch tape on his fingers because he didn't want the keyboard to be able to get his fingerprints. Why, I don't know, he covered up the camera on it because he felt like people could be watching him. During this time, Richard's becoming more violent. Uh, he's making threats. I mean, we were scared of our own son during that time. We slept with our doors locked. Not long after that, Richard took his life. This should have never, ever happened. And it was Adderall. People familiar with Richard's story say it illustrates the need for stricter guidelines for diagnosing ADD and for trying non-pharmaceutical treatments before prescribing Adderall. There is now clear evidence that the medication should be, in most instances, the last line of defense and not the first line of defense. And what the research is clearly showing is that over the long term, the drugs are not as effective as the behavioral interventions. The fees want changes, requiring doctors to see what other prescriptions their patients are taking, and requiring them to notify parents of adult children who are in danger. And there was information that they had in their file that if they had shared with us at that time, we'd like to think things would have been different. I mean, they noted in Richard's file that they thought he was suicidal. They say addicts should find a qualified professional to help wean them off it. You just don't cold turkey the stuff you need to be taken off of it slowly. Although the fees can't get their son back, they hope telling his story will prevent others from losing their loved ones. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Thanks, Lori. I, I'm not one to uh, prescribe lawsuits, but I do think we've got a case of medical malpractice there that those doctors should be held accountable for doing this. This It's like putting a gun in the hand of a crazy person and saying, well, you just make sure you don't shoot yourself. And then, uh, but you know, they say, I, I was listening to one analysis of the shootings that have taken place around the country, and people say, well, it's gun, 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 gun. And it's not gun, 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 gun. It's, uh, it's medicine, medicine, medicine. It is antipsychotic medicine over and over and over again. The people involved have been on some kind of uh, a psychotic medication. And that has been the trigger that has led to some of these very violent acts that have taken place. And so we say, well, let's have stricter gun laws. No, let's have stricter laws regulating uh, the prescribing of these uh, antipsychotic drugs. That's the problem, Terry. Sad story. It says. Well, up next, the true story behind one of Hollywood's hottest films. I was supposed to be exchanged for their leader. The leader came down, uh, he got in the boat, and then he, they didn't exchange me, so that's one of the lessons I learned is n never trust a pirate. The real Captain Phillips tells us his tale of survival when we come back. Pat Boone here with some good news you can trust. Today, our faith, families, and our freedoms are under attack. Polls say two out of three Americans no longer trust government. A stalled economy, weakening dollar, and politicians willing to steal money from our children to waste on unfixable problems. So, whom can you trust? Well, our money still says in God we trust. But do we? Or have we quietly allowed the things we hold sacred to be stolen by the enemies of traditional values? Today, our government spends almost twice its income, running up a tab for future generations into the hundreds of trillions. How can you stop this from happening to your family? Well, it's all covered in a fantastic new book, The Great Withdrawal, by Craig Smith and Dr. Lowell Ponte. Every American needs to read this book. Why don't you call now for a free copy of The Great Withdrawal? It's the simple truth you can trust. 
In 2008, my husband Gary departed for heaven. I was still grieving. And then to find out I had cancer, I began praying, God, how do I do this? Where do I do this? Cancer Treatment Centers of America was the place. Dr. Neelam outlined a plan that would take care of my mind and my body, and she prayed with me. For Bible-believing Christians, we're able to pray with them in a much deeper way as they begin to really rely upon their faith. At Cancer Treatment Centers of America, we believe in the power of faith and prayer as indispensable allies in the fight against complex and advanced stage cancer. I'm back in Telluride on the mountain skiing. I feel strong and healthy. Advanced medicine and technology. And I am a survivor. The warm embrace of the spirit and the power of prayer. These are happy tears. Please go to cancercenter.com forward slash faith. Appointments available now. Cancer Treatment Centers of America, care that never quits. The Academy Awards are still a few months away, but critics say Captain Phillips is a shoe-in for a Best Picture nomination. The movie tells the gripping story of the man who was the first American to be captured by pirates in 200 years. Ephraim Graham had a chance to speak with that man, the real Captain Phillips. Merchant Marine Captain Richard Phillips first shared his harrowing story with CBN News just months after it unfolded aboard the Maersk, Alabama cargo ship. It began with a radio call he will never forget. One pirate aboard, one pirate aboard. From then on, it was a 12 to 13 hour slippery slope of hide and seek, uh, a cat and mouse game on the Maersk, Alabama before we got into the lifeboat. Four pirates on board, four pirates. Hours turned into days, and that cat and mouse game now plays out on the big screen. We stay locked down until help arrives. No one comes out until you hear the non duress password from me, which is supper time. With Academy Award winning actor Tom Hanks playing Captain Phillips. In the real life tale, the Alabama's crew captured the pirate's leader. Phillips surrendered himself to the remaining three and boarded one of the ship's lifeboats. Off it, and you're in the water, and off you go. I was supposed to be exchanged for their leader. The leader came down, uh, he got in the boat, and then he, they didn't exchange me, so that's one of the lessons I learned is n never trust a pirate. Barkad Abdi plays one of the pirates, Musi, in the film. Before landing the role, he was a limo driver living in Minnesota. I'm from Somalia. I was born in Somalia. I lived in Somalia until I was six years old. You know, at the age of six, the war started. His young life in Somalia gave him the background to embrace the role. Kids have no parents. I was fortunate enough to have parents that took me from country to country, be a better person and make something out of myself. But he didn't have that, you know, and I understand him. Captain Richard Phillips was the first American seaman captured by pirates in 200 years. He was freed Easter Sunday, 2009, after Navy SEALs shot and killed three of his captors. Before his freedom, there were many lessons Phillips learned in his four days aboard the tiny 28-foot lifeboat. The biggest lesson? There is power to prayer, and, uh, and it did help me. I didn't pray for escape. I prayed for strength and patience. I prayed for the strength. God would, God, uh, will, will let me have the strength to continue and, and know when to escape and the patience to wait for that time. Even when that time did come, Phillips had a hard time believing it. It wasn't until I was being hoisted up on the Bainbridge onto the deck of that U.S. Navy ship, that uh, wonderful sight that I get to see, that I finally realized that, hey, I, I made it. I I'm out of there. I'm alive. He shared his story in a book and now on the big screen, where there is Oscar buzz. But Phillips' biggest honor is recognizing his fellow merchant marines and shining a light on the dangers at sea fellow men and women of the International Merchant Marine who are kept at gunpoint uh, as hostage waiting to be freed. Ephraim Graham, CBN News. It's an amazing story. Captain Phillips is rated PG-13 for violence and intense action scenes. Check your local listings for theaters and times. 
Well, still ahead, the time of the show where we turn the content over to you, our viewers, because we're going to be asking your questions. Garrett wants to know, why does God allow so much turmoil in the world? Pat's going to offer his response when we come back. On June 28, 2012, the United States Supreme Court voted to uphold the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Health reform is officially law. It will help the uninsured get health care insurance and add significant new prescription benefits. If you are uninsured, having trouble getting or struggling to pay for health insurance, call now. The free health hotline is accepting calls. You now have affordable options with real benefits. Call now. Hi, I'm Dr. Jason Buckwald. The cost of health insurance and the denial of coverage because of pre-existing conditions has been a serious obstacle to many uninsured Americans. But now the law has changed. If you are uninsured, having trouble getting or struggling to pay for health insurance, call the free health hotline. All callers will get the Together Health Group Prescription Pricing Plan free. Call the free health hotline now. Get the health insurance and prescription coverage you deserve. Call 1-800-399-9233. That's 1-800-399-9233. Call now. Did your magic phone service promise you everything but come up empty? Sign up for Basic Talk. Unlimited calling for only $9.99 a month with no annual contract. It's a home phone service you can count on. It's not magic. It's Basic Talk. Call, click, or go to Walmart today. And welcome back to the 700 Club. The younger generation is increasingly moving away from conventional religion. A Pew Research Center report found nearly 20% of Americans now consider themselves religiously unaffiliated. That's up from just over 15% five years ago. But still, the report found that many of the religiously unaffiliated still consider themselves spiritual in some way. 68% say they believe in God. 21% report praying every day. Only 6% say they're atheist or agnostic. New York City public schools may see two Muslim holidays added to their calendar. The city's only Muslim councilman has been pushing for years to add them. Now both candidates for mayor have endorsed his proposal. Opponents say if those holidays are added, then holidays for other faiths and cultural celebrations should be considered as well. Other proposals include the Chinese New Year and a Hindu holiday. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website, cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Are you suffering with joint discomfort but can't find a product that gives you the relief you need? Then stay tuned because the next 60 seconds will change everything. Because we're about to guarantee the first 100 callers a complimentary two-week sample of Instaflex, the top-selling joint formula at GNC. Instaflex is a top seller because it's our most powerful joint formula ever, so it can give you the relief you need. And now you're guaranteed to receive a complimentary two-week sample of Instaflex if you're one of the first 100 people to call 1-800-936-1073. If lines are busy, try again. Instaflex gives powerful, effective relief for your knees, hands, even your hips. And you're guaranteed a complimentary two-week sample if you're one of this station's first 100 callers. Instaflex is available at GNC, Walgreens, and these fine retailers. But you can only guarantee your complimentary two-week sample by calling now. 1-800-936-1073. 1-800-936-1073. Looking forward to who you want to be is only natural. Working toward who you're meant to be, only Regent. Our highly regarded 50-plus on-campus and online degree programs help you progress from what you like to do to what you live to. So from classroom to corner office, courtroom to Capitol Hill, you're prepared to excel in all aspects of life. Learn how knowledge and faith together can change your life for good and the world for the better. Accessible, affordable, accredited, only Regent. Before we get into some of your questions, I want to point out that the Regent University is having a a preview weekend is really fun to come if you if you're interested in finding out about college, uh, undergrad, or graduate schools. We have all of that here, just about everything you can think of. It's a beautiful uh, campus, and uh, uh, if you want to learn more, it's 1-800-373-5504. That number is on your screen, or you can log on to www.regent.edu. 
E D U. So it's exciting. It's a great school. It's a beautiful school, and this is a wonderful time to come. Mm, I mean, spring and fall here are particularly people beautiful. People have a good time. Yes. All right. Time to bring it on. All right. And ask you some questions. This is from Garrett Pat, who says, Why does God allow so much turmoil in the world? Um, if you begin, where does the turmoil come from? There's an enemy. His name is Satan. If you go back to the foundation of the earth, you find that there's the created being. They call him Lucifer, which meant the light one. He was the most beautiful of all of God's creation. And he began to look at himself and he said, I'm so beautiful, I'm so wise, I can run the universe better than God. Now, he took a third of the angels along with him. We call them demons. So why is there turmoil? Because there's this malevolent force who's trying to stir up. He hates people made in the image of God. He wants them to kill each other. He wants them to be destroyed. And he wants to turn them away from God. Now, why does God permit it? That was the question. Well, he has got a time when all of this is going to end. But right now, he's allowing free will. And the reason is, if he slammed Lucifer, I mean, really let him have it, then he would rule the universe through fear. And God wants to have a universe run by love, not by fear. And that's why God allows this stuff to happen, because he's allowing free will to take place, and he's allowing evil to show itself. And then when it's all over, he's going to end it. It won't be too much longer. All right. This is Susan who says, I run a business and I tithe off the gross income. I then draw a salary from my business. Do I have to tithe that too? It seems as if I'm tithing twice. I think you're right. I mean, to tithe off your gross income is incredible. For example, uh, uh, if uh, a grocery store makes $100 million and, and you tithe that, um, you will have probably three times the net profit of the institution. So. Uh, I, I don't think God wants us to beggar ourselves with our giving. He wants us to give joyfully. And so the idea that you're already paying from your business and now you take a salary and you want to tie that again. If you love the Lord, you feel you'd like to do it, it's, it's, it's a voluntary offering, but I don't think there's any necessity, or, necessity mm -hmm. compunction that says you've got to do that. All right. Okay, this is Laurel who says, I would really like to quit smoking. I have prayed that God helps take away my addiction, but I still have cravings. What am I doing wrong? Will you pray for me? Um, I'm going to give you some advice if you'll please take it. I used to smoke a pack and a half of cigarettes. Did you smoke? I did. I smoked about the same. You did? I had a very hard time quitting, but you know, one day, one day in a moment mm. when I realized that it wasn't just bad for my health, but that, that not by that time I was a believer, that I was ruining my, my body as the temple of God, the Lord just took that away from well, me. I saw the pictures of the cancers on rats. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> Dr. pretty. Dr. Eisner from down in, <laughs> in New Orleans. And, and uh, I, I, I said, I, I just, I'm not going to do this to myself. So I came out of an evidence class. I was in law school, buffed, threw it on the floor, grounded it. It's the last one I smoked. But listen, yes, what do you do? 21 days. I, I'm preaching over and over again, 21 days to create a new habit. Today you don't smoke. The next day you don't smoke. Next day you, but you don't say, I'm going to quit for life. I'm just not going to smoke today. It also means that you take all the cigarettes out of the house, flush them down the toilet, get, get rid of all the tobacco, and don't go bum any cigarettes off your friends. And that's what you have to do. 21 days, and what will happen is it happened to me. I got so I couldn't stand the smell of cigarettes. It made me nauseated even to be around the stinking stuff. So instead of being a craving, it became a repulsion. All right. Okay, this is Natalie who says, I married very young, and that marriage ended in divorce due to the fact that I committed adultery. I have since become a Christian and repented of my sins. I have since remarried, but my ex-husband says that my new marriage is forever, quote, cursed. Is this true? I think your old husband is sour grapes, and he he's regrets the fact that you're not married to him anymore. But no, your marriage isn't cursed. You broke the commandments, but nevertheless, you've come to the Lord. He has forgiven you. You've started a new life, so get on with it and enjoy it. And don't let your 
ex-husband take away your joy, because that's what he wants to do. He's jealous of the fact you got married to somebody else. This is Michelle who says, what happens to the bodies of the Christians who are taken up in the rapture? Will our physical bodies still be left on earth with just our souls going up to heaven? Some of that fanciful nonsense about people being taken out of an airplane and leaving their flight suit and a naked body <laughs> ascending to heaven. I mean, it's all nonsense. But what will happen? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. And so when the Lord comes back, these bodies of ours will be changed into glorious spiritual bodies like unto His glorious body. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, that's what it says. So what happens? You don't leave your body behind. It'll be changed at, at the rapture, mm -hmm. okay? That would be a wonderful time. <laughs> Praise yes. God, it'll be a wonderful time. He said, Paul said, I'm doing anything that I may achieve the resurrection of the dead. Amen. He's so wonderful, you can't even conceive of it. That's true. All right. Well, we thank you for your questions, everybody. We really appreciate hearing from you. Coming up, a small business owner who got scammed by his own employees. First mistake I made was leaving the business unattended. Uh, before I knew it, I was $80,000 in debt due to employee theft. Find out how one investment saved his company when we come back. Hey. If I can talk to anyone as much as I want to here, Namaste. Ooh, masaledad. Then why am I limited when I make international calls? Qué pena. Exactamente, amiga. That's why we'll connect the world with one low rate for unlimited calls. So I can call China as much as I want? Do that. And India? Ah! And I can call my girlfriend in Brazil. Claro! Over 60 countries. People thought we were crazy to give you unlimited long distance. Crazy, crazy generous! Feel free to talk at Phonics.com. Wednesday. Are you walking your way into a life of pain just to look good? Hear how you can step into a better future. Women look far more beautiful when they walk comfortably in a shoe than when they're uh, tottering because it's uncomfortable. Plus, a runaway son. It was the worst moment of my life. How this dad found himself during the search for his kid. Wednesday on The 700 Club. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. When John's Skate Shop started growing, John decided to open a few more stores. Business was good, but then he let his garden down. And before he knew it, John was more than $200,000 in debt. In the world of ice skating, there's a relatively new discipline called synchro skating that could make its Olympic debut as soon as 2018. At the local level, John Harmada is part of making this happen in this rink in Downers Grove, Illinois, where he runs a small shop called Geppetto's. When John first started in business, he and his family prospered. We were able to, to buy a house in a nice suburb. We were able to pay for that within a year. We had no debt, no credit card debt, no business debt. But then John learned a tough lesson about business growth and failure. Back then, I was a little greedy. I wanted to be the, the biggest kid on the block. I measured success by how many store locations can you have. John soon learned that running multiple stores was more difficult than he thought. First mistake I made was leaving the business unattended. Uh, before I knew it, I was $80,000 in debt due to employee theft. With the new stores failing, John was forced to shut them down and regroup. When the dust settled, he was more than $200,000 in debt and unable to pay his bills. The low point for me was when I had inventory bills coming due in September and October, and there was nothing to pay them with. I was tapped out and securing any type of loan with a second mortgage. Uh, the business was already, the line of credit had been maxed out for the business, so there was literally nowhere else to turn. At that point, John read a book by Pat Robertson called The Secret Kingdom. In it, something that really stood out in my mind was the law of reciprocity. How Pat describes in there about giving and receiving. The more you'll give, the more you'll receive. Soon after reading the book, he was challenged by something he heard on the 700 Club. I heard Gordon say one time, have faith and challenge God because this is the only time in the Bible that God says to challenge me is with your finances. So I'm thinking, okay, how do I do this? 
And then I would have said, well, join the 700 Club, be a partner, and you watch and see what happens. So I decided, okay, perfect. What have I got to lose? So John joined the 700 Club for $20 a month. Well, no sooner did I make that pledge when business started to increase. Uh, out of nowhere, I had somebody come in with a huge jersey order, which was worth $5,000. As the business grew, so did John's giving. He increased to the Thousand Club and eventually to CBN's Chairman Circle. Sure enough, business again started to increase. It was, it was just mind-blowing at the time. I couldn't believe it, how this just works. <laughs> All of a sudden, it just works. Uh, just recently, I had a, an idea to increase my giving to CBN. No sooner was I writing the check when already business started to go through the roof. I mean, to the point where I could hardly handle it. There is no better decision anyone can make than to invest in God, in CBN, and then watch what happens in their life. God is waiting for somebody. He said, look, I'm going to open the windows of heaven and pour you such a blessing you can't contain it. That's what he promises. So he says, will you be a partner with me? And, and the Bible says there are those that withhold more than is made, and it tends only to poverty. People who hold back, and those who give, get given back to. It's a law of reciprocity. It works. It is God's law, just like gravity. You give, and you get back. You give, and you get back. You don't give to get back. You give because you want to give. You give love, you get back love. You give kindness, you get kindness. You give friendship, you get friendship. It's just the way it works. It's the way God made the world. So why fight what God has set up? Just go with the flow and let God bless you. And by the way, I want to give you something. Um, our producer uh, had uh, me and Scott Ross go to a place in the mountains and uh, do a couple days of answering questions. And uh, we did this. It's called, How Shall We Now Live? We answer a whole lot of questions that you said are important to you. And... Well, people, can I just tell you, Jacqueline from Suffolk, Virginia, really yes. loved it. She said, How Shall We Now Live? Lifted my spirits. It encouraged me, helped me to refocus my sights on the scriptural foundations instead of the world's perspective. Okay, it's all there for you. We'll give you this when you join the 700 Club, which is a contribution of just 65 cents a day, less than a, about a half a can of soda pop mm. a day. And you can't, you know, we just had so many of our friends and partners here, and so we gave them the overview of everything around oh, the world yeah. that's being done. I, I know this, but when I see it all together, I am wowed. You yeah. know, I go, God, you are amazing. Who wouldn't want to be a part of that? Well, that's what your 700 Club, $20 a month. So please call, and you, you could be a part of, of changing the world. Okay. Well, still to come, one man's search for the answers to life's toughest questions. At times, I still tend to think about my past. Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why did God let this happen? Hear how prison helped him get his answers when we return. I don't think a lot of Americans really have a clue with morality anymore. I, don't, I think that we've kind of become a culture that just is trying to be accepting of everybody, trying not to step on anybody's toes and offend anyone. I recently watched Pat Robertson teaches How Shall We Now Live? And I liked it because he spoke truth. And I think that we have to get back to the basic of speaking truth and not being ashamed of the gospel, not being ashamed of Jesus, because that's the only way we're gonna change this world. Kids, we want them to grow up knowing God's Word. But in today's busy world, sometimes we could use some help. The free Superbook Kids Bible app has fun stuff your kids will love. They'll have a blast learning the Bible, playing great games, Did you win? watching cool videos, All right, follow me. discovering heroes in the Bible. They'll have fun while they learn God's Word. The Superbook Kids Bible app, available on iTunes and the Google Play Store. When you care, souls are set free. When you give, lives are made new. When you share, eternal life begins. When we all come together to love, miracles happen.
C.S. Lewis once said, pain is God's megaphone to rouse the deaf world. For Isaiah Borgham, that megaphone was being heard loud and clear. Growing up, Isaiah lost his mother and his sister. And if it hadn't been for a stint in jail, Isaiah might have lost himself as well. At times I still tend to think about my past. Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why did God let this happen? It's a question Isaiah Borgham has asked for most of his life. Why was he born out of wedlock? Why did his father abandon him? Why did his mother do the things she did? Why did she get AIDS? At first, Isaiah blamed his mom. Why would you do this to me? How could you be so selfish? Look at what, I don't have nothing now. And I was mad at my mom because my mom slept around and she ended up getting AIDS. Isaiah was just seven years old when his mother died from AIDS. He and his siblings moved in with their grandmother, but things got worse. Grandmother had a boyfriend who was often drunk and he'd lash out at the kids. Isaiah blamed her too. I always blame my grandma, like, how could she let me experience this? Why did I have to go through this? As the eldest child, Isaiah took it upon himself to look after his brother and sister. He tried to protect them, but he couldn't. And then came the ultimate why. He learned his four-year-old sister also had AIDS. In my heart, I think I kind of knew that she wasn't going to be here forever. So I, I just wanted to spend as much time with her as possible so I can build some memories and build some moments with her. And I think that's why it impacted me so deeply. Jasmine had contracted the disease in her mother's womb. Isaiah watched her suffer for a year before she died short of her fifth birthday. The night before she died, she said that the angels are coming to get her and take her to be with Jesus. Nothing changed for Isaiah and his brother until grandmother kicked out her boyfriend. But the damage was done. Now a teenager, Isaiah battled depression and suicidal thoughts. He now blamed God for his problems. I wore my anger on my sleeve, and I just, how I felt inside my heart and being mad towards the world and towards God. In high school, Isaiah was getting in trouble for fighting and being disruptive in class. He was suspended several times and almost didn't graduate. He turned most of his attention to girls and drinking, but that had consequences. He got a DUI and lost his license. A year and a half later, he got his second DUI and had to go to jail. But this time there wasn't no not avoiding or not going to jail, I had to go to jail. Isaiah was sentenced to 30 days. There he had time to reflect on his life, where he had been and where he was going. Jail was pretty much the waking up point when I realized that, okay, I can either continue to keep going down the path I'm on or I can change and seek the Lord and ask for forgiveness and ask him to heal my broken heart. Isaiah also began to read the Bible, and he realized that he was no better than those he blamed for his suffering. But the one who was better was Jesus Christ, and Isaiah wanted to be like him. And just through reading and learning about his life, that's when I realized that, okay, I'd rather be this type of man and live like this than be out here dating women and hooking up with them a few months later and then having all these broken and pointless relationships and thinking that thing made me a man because I had all that stuff. It's just the reading about Jesus and how humble he was. That was much more pleasing to my heart and to my soul to be that type of a man. After much thought and prayer, Isaiah released his bitterness to Jesus Christ. This right here behind me happens to be the jail that I went to for my second DUI, and it also happens to be the place where I accepted Jesus into my life as my Lord and Savior. Now 24, Isaiah is attending seminary in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and he helps out at his church with the youth group. Isaiah says he's learned much about God's love, but he understands he's only begun the journey. I didn't fully understand that he was good until I saw him work in my life when I was in jail and how he delivered me and brought me out of my suffering. And I realized that, okay, Jesus suffered on a cross and died for my sins. If he can go through that, I can suffer anything that I need to suffer if it's going to bring strengthen me and bring me closer to the Lord. Amazing story. Isaiah's story is a story of choices. 
You know, for him, he was impacted by the choices made by his parents, the choices made by his grandmother. And, you know, you can feel so victimized. You can get so bitter, so wounded, and rightfully so. I mean, all these unfair things done, being, being left without family, being damaged by the things that were said and done to you. Here's the other choice. You can stay there and be bitter and be a victim of all of that. Or you can do what Isaiah did. You can say, this is not the road I want to walk. This is not the man I want to be. He read about Jesus and said, that's the kind of person I want to be. You know, we all have that choice. The Bible says, whosoever will may come. That means if you want to know the love of God, if you want the forgiveness of God in your life, it's here for the asking. You can reach out and take it. This is what the Word of God says. If any man is in Christ, he becomes a brand new creation. Old things pass away, and all things become brand new. All things. So how do you become in Christ? You start by coming to the end of yourself and saying, God, I need you, Jesus. I want you. I understand now that it was for my sin that you died. For the sins of my parents, yes, my grandparents, yes, those around me, yes, but now today, I'm declaring personally, you died for me. I am a sinner in need of a savior. Come into my life, come into my heart, forgive my sin and set me free. I want to live for you. I want to learn about you. I want to walk with you. I want you to be in me, and I want to be in you, Christ. You know, that's a great transformation that happens when you do that. It's more than just a prayer. It's a heart turnaround. It's a, it's a complete turning from thinking one way, living one way, to living differently. Get into the Word of God. If you want to live differently, if you want the kind of change that Isaiah had, which was radical, you can have that too today. Jesus loves you. If you'd like to pray with someone about whatever your need is, you can call the toll-free number that you see on your screen. It's 1-800-759-0700. The person on the other end of that line is someone who is in Christ because they prayed the same prayer. So please, call now. Pat? Thanks, Terry. Well, that's all the time we have for today's program. Tomorrow, we've got a modern-day tale of the prodigal son, told from the dad's perspective. Hear how they both found healing. And we leave you today with these words from Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson, and we'll see you tomorrow on the 700 Club, so don't miss it. God bless all of you. Bye-bye. Wednesday. Are you walking your way into a life of pain just to look good? Hear how you can step into a better future. Women look far more beautiful when they walk comfortably in a shoe than when they're uh, tottering because it's uncomfortable. Plus, a runaway son. It was the worst moment of my life. How this dad found himself during the search for his kid. Wednesday on The 700 Club. It felt like nothing at first, but then it started getting worse and worse. In like a week, it started to hurt. I saw a pretty bad infection, so I kind of got upset and, and really scared. She thought I would, if I wouldn't do something about it, it would eat my toe off, literally. I record the 700 Club every day, so I was watching it, and I heard Terry say, There's someone, um, a parent, you're praying for a child named Timothy. God has heard your prayer, and the thing you've asked for will be done. And it was just such a personal word of knowledge. I just got really emotional. I thought that it would get healed in a couple of days, and I was really happy. But it turned out it got healed in a couple of hours, actually. I did see a change right away. I felt really good because I could run with Mom on the jogging trails, and I could do all the stuff that I wanted to do before. 